Let me pray for us as we continue. Oh God, you who are the God of love and God of relationship, the God who knows where we have come from, where we have been, where our feet and our bodies and our souls have been. You who know where we have come from and where we stand today and where we are going. We pray to you, God. We pray to you, this divine mystery. We pray to you, Yahweh, and we thank you that you know where we have come from and you know where we are going. And so God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue guiding this time, this sacred moment together, this online space and all the different places where we have come from, that we would bring our coming froms into the space today, that we would open our hearts and open our minds and open our, our souls to hear a word from you about where we have come from and where we are going and where we find ourselves today with you. We welcome the doubts and we welcome the cynicism and we welcome the curious questions and we welcome uh, the anger and we welcome everything because you welcome us and you welcome where we have come from. So Holy Spirit, I pray that as we open our hearts to the sacred text that your Holy Spirit would um, illuminate the text and also may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, God, for you are my rock and you are my strength and you are my fortress and you are my redeemer. And I pray all these things in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, buenos dias, church. We have been in the song of Zechariah in the gospel according to the author of Luke. And for the first two Sundays of Advent, we've been looking at the centrality of a God who does not forget God's own people. In the first half of the song in Luke 2, in the song of Zechariah, we remember or we recall a God who remembers his promises and keeps his promises, a promise-keeping God. And then Pastor Bobby last week not only showed us, but he sung to us, like that was genius, Bobby, like you grabbing your Bible and like holding it like a baby. I will never forget that. Now I can't hold my Bible that close and read it without my glasses, but that was genius. Uh, Pastor Bobby last week not only showed us, but sung to us about the tender mercies of our God and the prophetic calling of Zechariah towards his son, John the Baptist, that uh, had not well, he had been born at that moment, and he titled it a lullaby of light in the darkness. So today I like to, for us to begin looking at John the Baptist, which is the tail end of that chapter, verse 80, chapter one, verse 80 in Luke. I like to begin there and then move over and jump over towards Elizabeth in a previous section of Luke one. So I'm going to be jumping a little bit around, and I'd like, uh, Rob, if you're still here, which I think you are, if you could throw up the slide of where we're going to begin in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, and then I'm going to read the words of Elizabeth in verse 39. Oh, I'm supposed to do that. Yes, thank you. See, I, I my Zoom uh, things have atrophied as well. Here it is. Let me share with you what I'm about to read with y'all. Yes, I do not like Zoom, you guys. Do not like it at all. And it's not showing. Oh, here we go. It is. The child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day that he appeared publicly to Israel. So that's the last little verse in chapter one of Luke. And then I'd like to read the next chunk that we're gonna jump into. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed in a loud cry, Blessed are you among mujeres, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Oops. 
And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't want to miss that little verse at the end of chapter one, because it parallels Jesus, Jesus's experience as well of going into the wilderness. So John the Baptist is going into the wilderness and it says that he was growing strong. He was growing and he be was becoming strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until his public appearance before Israel. Jesus in chapter two, verse 40 says that the child grew, the child Jesus grew and became strong was filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. So John and Jesus have an experience of going into the wilderness to grow and become strong into their own times of silence and into uh, their own times of aloneness and solitude. And we don't know much about what exactly happened to John in the wilderness for 30 years until he was publicly announcing himself and self-revealing before Israel. But we do know that the wilderness is a place outside of the city gates. So the wilderness has a physical place. And in this context, it was outside of the city gates. There, John was in the wilderness, growing, becoming strong. But even so, he was unknown. And even so, he was hidden. And even so, we don't know what much happened during that time. He may have been unknown and hidden to us in the text, but he was not unknown and not unseen and not hidden from God. And I think that's a word that's important for us to know because we can quickly jump through this text and just go quickly to, oh, well, John the Baptist was a prophet and, and he was a truth teller and he was preparing the way of the Lord. But in that time in the wilderness, this was a sacred place. And Jesus and John the Baptist have many parallels of what happens in the wilderness, growing strong, strong in spirit, growing in wisdom, and it's training before God sends you out. Like it took 30 years for three years of ministry. It prepared him for 30 years for only three years of ministry. That's how much courage it was going to take. So God is shifting the people and the attention of the people and the powers from Jerusalem to the desert outside of the city gates. That is where the spirit is residing. That is where the people are residing. And God chose a man that in that moment needed to be okay with being unseen for 30 years. That might be hard for me. Being unseen for 30 years to build up his character for the prophetic task not just any task, but a task that was going to take his life. I think that's important for us to pause and remember. So he was out in the wilderness, out in the desert. And I wanted to give you a picture, a quick picture of what this desert may have looked like. So I went to the desert. Uh, let me see again if I can share the screen and show you. Um, I went to the desert in November of 2008. I went to northern Algeria. I went to serve at a refugee camp of uh, Sahrawi people. Sahrawi people are the last colony in, in Africa to gain their independence from Spain. Can you believe that? That happened in 1975. And so I had the opportunity to go there for 10 days uh, into the desert, into the camps. And I, uh, the conditions there were not prime for life. They were not prime for having 350,000 people living in the desert. And I'd like to show you some of those pictures for you to imagine what this could have been like. This is the desert uh, in Algeria. So this is the Sahara Desert. And it is one of the most beautiful places on earth that I've experienced. And I had some holy, holy times in the desert um, where I was so completely disoriented. I didn't know where it was north, south, east, or west because there was not a building around, not a bush, not a stick, not a stone, just sand all around. And I had some of the most worshipful times in the silence there. So this is the Sahara Desert. Um, I wore a melfa uh, to respect my uh, Muslim siblings. 
and this was one of my roommates um, there. I was trying to, to show you the background, just how we got in these cars and I didn't know where they were taking us because it's so disorienting. The vastness is so disoriented and disorienting and the heat is so disorienting. It can take, it can get up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit in, in the desert, in the Sahara Desert. And um, this, this time in the wilderness was a great experience for me to just remember how small I am and how vast the world is. So what are the, what are the conditions in the wilderness? What happened in the desert? Uh, one thing that I found out is that there's no water in the desert. The United Nations trucks had to bring water for us to drink. There are no aquifers under uh, in that region. And so the water had to be brought in. You can die very quickly without water. I don't know how many days you can last without food, but we know that there is even less time to survive without water. It seems like nothingness though in the desert, uh, but something is happening and something was happening in the life of John the Baptist, as well as Jesus. There's an active, uh, an active God operating, an active spirit operating in the wilderness. There's activity, there's mystery, there's not nothing, there's something, especially with the presence of God being there. What does God uh, say about the desert? How does, how does God relate to, to the desert? Uh, in Isaiah 41, verses uh, 17 through 20, let me read that uh, real quick for you. Uh, God is talking about the desert and talking about the wilderness in a certain way, and he sees, he sees what's what's lacking and responds to it, responds to it in Isaiah 41, verses 17 through 20. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open up rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, so that, so that all may see and know, and all may consider and understand that the hand of Yahweh has done this, the Holy One of Israel. When God sees the wilderness and when God sees the desert, he provides this. It's a space that God has provided and he fills it with something, not nothing. So that, verse 20, that all may see, that all may know, that all may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created this. The wilderness is not only a physical place for us, it can also be a spiritual place for us. And in the wilderness, uh, Trees can grow, but they have to go looking for water, right? In the wilderness, trees can grow, but they go looking, their roots go looking for water, for the thing that's going to sustain them. Not many trees can survive in the wilderness or in the desert. There's only certain types of trees that can survive. In the wilderness also, I think John may have witnessed God's presence. God may have surprised John with God's presence. There's there's this mystery there that I wonder what that time in the, in the wilderness was like. There's lots of other stories, like when Jacob wrestled with God in the wilderness and declares, huh, God was in this place and I did not even know it. Because sometimes it is hard to see God, even and especially when our tears and our weeping in the wilderness kind of cloud our vision. And that is okay. God was in this place, and I did not even know it, Jacob says. Hagar names God in the wilderness. Hagar names God in the desert, in a place that kind of looked like what, where I went in the Sahara Desert, dry and hot, and you could quickly die. Hagar names God in the desert, and Yahweh provided water where there was none for her, for her and also for her son, Ishmael. And then the first woman to ever First person and first woman to ever name God says, you are the God who sees me, Elroy. I have seen and also I have been seen by the God who sees me. In the wilderness, God provides fire to uh, guide the people of Israel by night and a cloud to guide during the day. 
in the wilderness manna is a daily prayer. Give us this manna today. It's a daily prayer for mercy. The Holy Spirit is in the wilderness, I believe. The Holy Spirit calls you into the wilderness for different seasons of life, and there are different seasons of wilderness. And in the wilderness, I believe that the Spirit is both wild and wise. The same Holy Spirit that we were talking during our, our mini Genesis series, the same Spirit that hovers over the chaos and hovers over the darkness, that is the same Holy Spirit that is hovering over your wilderness. Not just hovering, but in it in the wild and wise of the wilderness. The role of the Holy Spirit is important here because the Holy Spirit is hovering over every person in the Advent story. Without the Holy Spirit in this Advent story, we are toast. John was filled with the Spirit from the womb. How did John grow strong in spirit? Pastor Bobby and I were sermon texting this weekend, working for and sermon prepping. And uh, he asked, how did John grow in spirit, in this, in spirit, strong in spirit? Who raised him like that? Where did he inherit that resolve? I love that question that Bobby asked. And then he said, well, probably from his mama. We have just preached in Zechariah. Zechariah is prophetically calling uh, John's calling and John's purpose in his life, but also his mama was another person in John's life. John was probably told as he was growing up about Zechariah's song, and John also was probably told the things that Elizabeth knew because of Elizabeth's time with Mary. So as we jump back into the story, here we have a John, a son, a beloved son that God is going to use for 30 years in the wedding, for 30 years in the watching, for 30 years in the training of the wilderness. But there is someone who is there beforehand that is helping him find his calling in the wilderness, his mother and his father. And today I'd like for us to look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth in chapter one, verse 39, going back to that little story and that little encounter with I'm not going to mess with the Zoom sc sh uh, screen sharing, y'all, because it is confusing me. So I'm going back to my Bible, and you can go there as well. Uh, in 139, this is what Elizabeth is experiencing in her encounter with Mary. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. She is a descendant of Aaron, who is Moses' brother. She lives in the province of Judah. It is a rural place. She's Mary's prima, so she's Mary's cousin. She is older, she uh, is dealing with infertility, is not the whole of her existence, but for a woman during that time, it could have felt like the whole of her existence because society saw her as one who had not born a child and especially a child who was male. In 125, it says, chapter one, verse 25, it says that Elizabeth uh, says that God has taken away the disgrace from her people and has allowed her to become pregnant. In chapter 1, verse 60, she is the one that confirms uh, John's name, which means Yahweh is gracious. And even though this is something that I was uh, uh, texting back and forth with my friend Jed, I posted something on social media and something as mundane as uh, posting something on social media becomes sermon prep. And, and my friend Jed was texting back in, on Instagram and said, I was thinking about Elizabeth just yesterday. And she, he pointed out that she, we don't have a record that she ever heard an audible announcement, an audible annunciation from an angel, nor did she hear her husband's voice because he became mute to the sanctuary. So where did she get her information about that which God had done in her life? No audible announcement from no angel, no husband's voice retelling the story of what happened to him. She had her own story. Maybe she had her own silent nights, Jeff said. And I love the way that he posed that. So I wonder how did God speak to Elizabeth? Was this a wilderness experience for her? There is silence. She can't talk to her husband. She has not, not that we know of, she has not heard from an angel. The announcement was made to Zechariah was silence her wilderness, but a different kind of silence. Was it disorienting? Was she scared of having a baby at an older age? 
we wonder about Elizabeth and her knowledge of the mystery of the divine. See, God has spoken to the different characters in this Advent story in many different ways because God doesn't just speak in one way to you or to me. God speaks to us in different ways and as many ways as there are people, God speaks to wombs, to silence, in sanctuaries, in deserts, in the wilderness, between two women having cafe con leche and exchanging stories in the province of Judah, in hospitals, in the commute, in the classroom, on social media. Elizabeth hears the sound of Mary's voice and this is what she hears, the deep calling out to her deep. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country. So Mary has just had her announcement. And Mary has just uh, received shocking news, shocking news, as you can imagine. And when she entered, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry. Here's the thing that I want you to notice when, when Mary enters into uh, uh, Elizabeth's house, I don't know what type of greeting was done back then, but, but if you're in Nicaragua, you'd be like screaming, going, buenas, buenas. I don't know if it was that kind of buenas, but Elizabeth hears the sound of Mary's voice and John leaps in her womb. And Elizabeth is filled with her spirit, with God's Holy Spirit. Elizabeth hears, John leaps, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Those verbs are very important in our calling and our transformation to hear, to sense the things that are moving in us, that the Holy Spirit is moving in us, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are toast. The one who gives revelation about all things is the mysterious web in this story, in this Advent story, and that's the Holy Spirit using Elizabeth and John and wombs and Mary. The same spirit wind that was in the beginning in in Genesis hovering, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that is inside of Elizabeth's womb. And she declares, blessed are you among women, And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Bendita eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre. Find you an Elizabeth. Find you a witness in the wilderness. Find you someone who is waiting and watching and witnessing what's going on in their life and attentive to what's going on also in your life. We need an Elizabeth. We need an Elizabeth in our lives, one that is seasoned in silence, one that has been formed by the silence, and one that is waiting in the wilderness. Elizabeth isn't just waiting, she is also watching, and she is attentive to what God is doing, not just in her, but also in Mary. Pastor Bobby was praying for me this morning, and Uh, sent me a text message and said, I'd like to remind you or was asking God to remind me of the invisible hope that we have before there's ever visible transformation. Those words had an echo to this story. Find you those people and those witnesses in the wilderness that will remind you of things that are unseen and things that are invisible before you even are able to see them and manifest them. To see the invisible hope in someone else before there's any visible transformation. One of my favorite things to hear is when I've heard a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Kevin, who came to preach at our church this year to say, when I have felt hopeless, he says, can I have hope on your behalf? What a kind question to have when someone doesn't have hope, when someone doesn't believe the things that God has said about you. That's an okay thing to say as well. Can I have hope on your behalf? Not just say, well, have hope, have hope. No, no, have hope. But for you to say to somebody else, hey, why don't, why, while you don't have hope, can I have hope on your behalf? I see the invisible hope in you. Find you in Elizabeth 
because Elizabeth and Mary are seeing each other. They have seen eyes, they have spiritual eyes. And let me see if I can share a screen because I have a beautiful piece of art, uh, a beautiful rendition here of, of Mary and Elizabeth. Let's see if I can switch it. Oh, there's a desert. There's, look at this beautiful art. Elizabeth sees the unseen. She has X-ray vision to see and call out what is happening in Mary's womb. Find you a voice in the wilderness of your wild existence that calls you out of the wilderness and into the wilderness with God. That's a line that actually my friend Nicola shared with me as we were going back and forth about what does the wilderness mean to us? And Nicola was saying, you know, it's a voice calling out the things that God is birthing in you, calling you out of places of wilderness where you don't need to be, but also calling you into the wilderness with God. So there's different kinds of wildernesses. Finding safe and trusted voices like the, the joy, I love the joy and the excitement, uh, but also probably the fear and, and anticipation between these two women, but they're safe and trusted, calling out the calling in you, calling out the things that God is birthing in and through you. Elizabeth and Mary are doing the work of Jesus by being carriers of this work. One is carrying our savior and the other one is carrying the one that's going to announce and prepare the way for our savior. That's the work of Jesus. They're watering the work, they're weeding the work, they're cultivating this work and, and it starts between them. Neither child has been born yet, but the work is already being cultivated through friendship, through connection, through storytelling that's bonding these women. Remember that John means Yahweh is gracious. Elizabeth is mothering grace in her own body. And as she mothers grace in her own body, she's going to be able to spill over that grace unto others. See, she's in her second trimester, Elizabeth is, and uh, Mary is in her first trimester, and she is starting to feel this joy leap. She's carrying grace. And then in verse 43, there's a beautiful confession that it, confession that it wasn't until I slowed down that I was able to see that Elizabeth made a confession of faith, even before Jesus had been born. She says, how is it that the mother of my Lord has come to me? How is it that the mother of my Lord, the word there is actually Lord, and not just a Lord, but my Lord, she possesses this God, this Jesus. She already has knowledge of this Messiah and calls him my Lord. I wonder if Elizabeth was one of the early disciples and first disciples of Jesus, and Jesus hasn't even been born yet. That's how powerful his presence is. He hasn't said a word and he's already called you in and called you close. As soon as I heard your voice, greet me in verse 44. Elizabeth says, when I heard your voice, greet me. When I heard your voice, Maria, my baby leaped for joy within me. As soon as I heard your voice, your voice called the things that God has placed in me, both physically and spiritually. As soon as I heard your voice, the voice of a friend, the voice of a mentor, the voice of a, a teacher, a coach, maybe even a pastor. As soon as I heard your voice and I saw your eyes, I love how these two women are looking at each other face to face. And Elizabeth, she is smiling. And they're seeing each other face to face, that spiritual intimacy. When you see another and you let another see you, those things just leap in you and you call it out in another person. They become animated by the spirit. They come to life if we slow down to see and to be seen. You know, Elizabeth could have only cared about what was going on in her life. She could have seen Mary as a competition, like, what do you mean? You also got an announcement from, uh, from the Lord. She could have said, you know, my child is chosen too. Um, I don't care about your child. But a spirit-filled woman calls out what's going on in someone else's life and points to the Jesus inside of us and, said, and says, this is good. This is glorifying to God. 
and points to what Jesus is, do is doing in us, but also through us in collaboration, not competition. So I love the spirit of these two women as I look and I stare at them and imagine them. Maybe they looked like this. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. What had been spoken to Mary? The plan of salvation of Jesus, Messiah, the name that is above every other name, the one that was and is and is to come. Salvation, restoration. They explicitly were hoping for uh, for to be redeemed from Roman empire and Roman rule to say, how is it that the mother of my Lord, that, that was also a prophetic statement against believing that Caesar was not Lord. It was very personal and it was also very political to say, my Lord. What is the plan of salvation? Mary has just sung her own song and saying that the prideful will be brought low, the meek are gonna be lifted up and Jesus is going to make right all the wrongs that haven't ever been done to you. This is what Elizabeth is excited about. The plan of salvation, not just our souls, but our bodies restored back unto God and restored back to each other and Jesus being our righteousness and Jesus being our justicia. That is a work that's happening between these two women. This is a work that they're announcing from their wombs. The work of the wilderness happens with the work of community. The work of the wilderness is waiting. It is watching. It's not doing nothing. It is waiting and watching with the other witnesses. The work of the wilderness and the incarnation is happening in your everyday life, not just during Advent. I like to finish by reading. Um, an excerpt of a little book that I've been reading. It's, an, it's a book called Honest Advent by Scott Erickson. I don't know if you, you may follow him online. I think he goes by Scott the Painter on uh, social media. And I just love, um, here's his book. He's not paying me to say all this, but I love all the art. He's an artist and the way that he helps us think outside of the box. And so I've been reading uh, Honest Advent and yesterday's story really uh, moved me about um, about how it connects to, to Elizabeth and to, and to Mary and to John the Baptist. And he's talking about the assumptions um, of Advent and the assumptions that we bring into Advent and the really high expectations that we bring to Advent. But I just love how down to earth and creative Scott is. And so I'd like to finish with, with this thought. Scott says, Christmas comes with many assumptions, some helpful, some not so much. Spirituality also comes with many assumptions and the ones that fail us are the ones we make about what it's supposed to be like. Who is worthy for it to happen to? What kind of outcome it's supposed to have for us? Assumptions like you should be more than you are now to be pleasing to God. Your weaknesses are in the way of God's plan for your life. Your lack of religious fervor is a disqualifier for divine participation you're probably not doing it right. Other spiritual people have something you don't have. Our assumptions hinder our spiritual journey in all kinds of ways. And the antidote to assumption is surprise. I love this line. The surprise of Christ's incarnation is that it happened in Mary's day as it is happening every day in your lack of resources, your overcrowded lodging, your unlit night sky, and your humble surroundings. It's a surprise that life can come through barren places, like in Elizabeth's life. It's a surprise that meek nobodies partake in divine plans, like the shepherds. It's a surprise that messengers are sent all along the hidden journey of your life to let you know that you are not alone. It's a surprise that you will be given everything you need to accomplish what you've been asked to do. It's a surprise that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Amen. Nothing can separate you from love. Your assumptions believe that there must be something that can, but surprise, 
nothing can. So may you thank God with joyful surprise at how much you have assumed incorrectly. As I think about the story of the work of the wilderness, the time in the wilderness, the people in the wilderness, as I think about waiting and watching and the witnesses and anticipation, as I think about the hard and holy work of the wilderness, I just want to say that I have deep empathy for each and every one of our wildernesses. Wherever this Advent finds you, there's not one wrong way to do Advent, but I do want to encourage you to watch and to wait and to do so with an Elizabeth in your life. One that will call out and remind you and have hope on your behalf when you have run out of hope or have run out of love or have run out of grace, mercy or compassion or justice. And so God, you who are the one that calls us into the wilderness and you who are the one who goes ahead with your Holy Spirit seeking us, seeking earnestly after us like you did with Hagar, like you did with Zechariah, like you did with John, like you did with Elizabeth. God, we ask, God, we ask that you would give us the revelation that we need for today. And it may be small, it may be small and surprising, but if it comes from your spirit, God, it will be deep and wide. And I pray that every woman and man and sibling and sister and brother will know today, certainly, that you have loved them with an everlasting love and that you are drawing them with loving kindness and that there's not one moment of our day from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. You never speak a word of condemnation about us or to us, God, but you are the one that says that we are blessed and that we are loved with your steadfast love. So thank you, God, today for your small and spirit-filled surprises and for the people that you send us in our times of wilderness to draw closer to you and closer to, um, to your love. And may your love go into all the places that it is missing in our lives that we need reminders of your steadfast love. And all these things I pray in your name. Amen and amen. As we move into a time of communion, which is happens way faster when we do this online, y'all. Um, as we come before in, in community, in the fellowship of believers on the night that Jesus was betrayed, tomó pan, dio gracias y lo partió diciendo, este es mi cuerpo que por ustedes es partido. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. Y después de haber cenado, tomó la copa y nos dijo que este es el pacto en su sangre the promise keeping God, reminding us that God has not forgotten, forgotten us and has not forgotten you. And every time we take this bread and drink this cup of love, we remember that God's steadfast love does not run dry, even in the wilderness. There's pools of water of his love and of this blood that remind us of that. God, I thank you for this time and I thank you for the opportunity to remember your broken body, to remember Elizabeth's broken body, to remember Mary's broken body, broken um, as mothers of the faith, your, your body broken for us and your blood spilled for us. God, I thank you for this time um, and I pray that you will be with every sister and brother and sibling today in Jesus' name. <clears throat>